Okay. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the second Contentful User Meetup in Berlin. Uh, <laughs> uh, just be, it's what everybody is aware, we are now live on YouTube. So be careful what you say, this is going to be on the internet forever. <laughs> uh, okay. This evening we have actually uh, two speakers, two very exciting speakers, if I might say. Uh, I'm going to cheat on this one and read out loud. <laughs> Just because I'm not a developer, you know, I don't want to say bullshit here. Um, so the first speaker is uh, Felix Jung. Um, I actually met Felix at one of the Contentful parties one year ago and he was all super excited. And he's one of the, um, one of our most popular contributors uh, for the JavaScript SDK. Hey, JavaScript people, am I right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, so, big fan from the beginning. Uh, Felix works as a front-end engineer for SumUp, uh, another uh, German-based um, startup here. Yeah. And he's going to talk today about configure once, reuse forever, managing fields with uh, contentful utils. Right? Am I, did I say it right? right. No. And the second talk is uh, going to be given by one of our contentfuleros, uh, Jakob over there. So, and Jakob, Jakob is going to talk about uh, GraphQL, a very pop popular topic right now, and how to use it uh, with contentful. Um, so, Felix? Okay, Irina, thanks for the kind introduction. Um, yeah, configure once, reuse forever, managing fields with contentful utils is what I'm going to talk about. Um, so we're going to talk about content types and how to manage fields on, on these content types. Um, as you said, I am a front-end engineer at SumUp. We are a mobile point of sale company, which means we uh, build card readers like this one. Um, and with these, we basically empower small merchants in, uh, in many countries to be able to take card payments. Um, we are in a lot of places in the world. So you see the US, you see Brazil, even Chile and Europe that comes out at 16 countries worldwide so far. And as you can imagine, with this many countries, sometimes managing your content gets a bit difficult. You get different business requirements from, from, for the various markets that you're in. And um, you need to somehow deal with that in your, in your, uh, in your content and the way uh, you present it to your users. Um, also manage things like where is my content visible? So is it going to show up on all on all domains or just on, on some? Um, we started using Contentful in late 2015, uh, thanks to uh, Juan Ramos, which uh, who is a is, is a designer here at Contentful these days. <laughs> Used to be a colleague of mine, <laughs> and um, yeah, we we have been using it for web projects so far. So. We don't use it in apps or anything. It's mainly for us to, to drive our, our web-related projects. Some examples. Um, where is my clicker? Okay, so we drive our blog with Contentful. So um, you, you have blog authors, you have um, the categories of our blog and the individual blog posts, which are all content types coming from Contentful. Um, then we also have these kinds of showcase pages for our merchants where they on the marketing website can inform themselves about uh, specific use cases for, for our product and, and the type of business that they run. So here you have these, these basically these features, which are each a con or which are con is a content type. Um, you, have, you have the overall page, which is a content type and you, you can choose, um, you can choose uh, like the hero that you want to use and some, some other data that we then compose in the front end um, to present it. Um, we also have landing pages for partnerships. So um, our business development team can create these landing pages uh, for our various partners that basically enable or redistribute our devices to, to even smaller merchants. So think of Salesforce uh, type of applications. Um, here you see like all these benefits of using our products. They're each individual. This is a content type and we have different entries that then the business 
development people can choose from um, for for their landing pages. And um, yeah, just just the, the various data things. Uh, now, obviously, when when we started using Contentful, we were trying just experimenting and um, trying things out, and we've evolved over time and changed our, our uh, content model quite a bit. Um, along the way, let's just say mistakes were made. <laughs> um, I'm going to give you a brief overview of what happened. So, um, level one, when we started out, we were like, okay, let's try this. Um, how, how does this actually work? And um, we, let's click your thingy. Whoop, okay. Um, so we basically came up with a model where each page that we wanted to render was a content type and um, the pages are rendered through some node backend um, that pulls the data using the CDA, so the content delivery API. And, um, and then basically in this content type, everything is a text field or, or an image, like a reference to an image, something like this, right? Um, the problem with this is the more pages you create, it, it doesn't really scale because every page has to have its own fields and then you change some something about your business model and um, you have to basically update every page where, where one of these text fields refers to something like a price or whatever, right? So it's, it's quite difficult to manage. Um, now, if you think about how the web has developed over the past years, you've, you've seen components take over, right? So by React popularizing the component model, um, We've started to, as developers, started to think in these component terms. And so when we realized that, we kind of changed, changed the way we wanted to approach this whole thing. This is more or less where we are right now. Um, we, we made our pages more, use more references, right? So individual sections of a page are references to certain content types, say like a, uh, a hero content type. Um, that then the creator, the content creator can, can pick as a reference for this specific page. Then these, these uh, individual text boxes that you saw on our landing pages, they are, they are a content type and you can have a one too many reference to, to, different, um, to different text blocks. All right, so this, this scales better. Um, and then like the, the idea was, okay, going forward, maybe we should go even further. Um, and just have like a, a, the page be a content type that is a, just a really st structure that where each section is configured to be a reference to a particular other content type. So you would have like the, the hero section at the top, then you would have uh, like these, these references that we had before. Then here in the middle, you might have a section that, that is like either like a special a call to action section or something about the product or whatever, right? And you could have a one to one re reference to to an entry of, of, of something, uh, some other content type. Um, yeah, and that's, that's basically one, one thing that we were heading for. And right now, um, the basically stage four, um, a colleague of mine last week started working on, on a proof of concept where basically we want, some, we want people to be able to um, just have a page that is just a list of one to many or just a one to many reference where basically people can pick I don't know, one to 10 different, uh, different other entries from other content types and this, just mix them together in any way they want. And then with very few clicks, get to a working page. Now, why am I telling you all of this? Because the obvious lesson here is reference all the things, right? Um, after hearing that story, you might go, yes, let's do it. You might also get a bit scared you were like, no, maybe not. <laughs> or maybe it's happening. So what I found is that, oh, great color. Um, content modeling can be really hard, right? So you, you, you have to always evaluate when, when using, when using this, this, uh, this system, this wonderful system that you've built, you have to, um, evaluate, okay, how good is the reusability of, of what I'm building here? So if I have lots of, lots of references, then, then I have a great, like, great reusability of existing content because I just reference existing content and that's gonna work out really nicely. And on the other end, you might have um, a lot of abstraction in particular in the web app when people, when the end users uh, use, um, use the web app to, to compose the different content types and, and entries into, into a new, um, entry. 
And like what I found or what we found is that you really need to evaluate on a case by case basis, how much freedom you want to give people. And at the same time, how much uh, you want to, you want to make the whole thing scalable. Right. Um, so this learning process, so you might encounter one of the following things. You might see yourself experimenting with, with different ways to model your content. And um, you might duplicate content types, which works uh, really great in the, in the web app. You can just duplicate an existing content type and then uh, make some changes to it. Uh, you might want to migrate to a fresh space to start a new experiment with brand new uh, content types. And um, this works like great in batch. You, you, have the, um, you have the contentful batch lips, a, a JavaScript library that you can use for this and write custom migration scripts to get stuff from one space to the other. Um, you also have these uh, import and export tools which have been re rewritten recently and, and are great for that. Um, but usually these jobs are in batch and you might just wanna like use a scalpel and, and, uh, and do smaller things. Then you might also want to delete fields from content types. That can also be sometimes a bit difficult because you have to disable them first, save the content type, then delete them, save the content type again. Um, it works, but it can get tedious. And also um, you want to maybe clone an existing field to a different content type. And I so far haven't found a way to do that in the web app where you just say, I have this nicely configured URL field here that has a really long regex for me to do validation on and has some other properties that I might want to use on a different content type. And I don't know how to deal with it. The great thing is that, that um, as developers, we want to automate these kinds of tests, right? Uh, tasks. And Contentful, uh, because everything is just data, your content model is just data, you can manipulate it in code, right? So if you, if you want to, to do something specific, uh, the content model is just data and you have APIs to manipulate the content, to delete content, to copy content, to con copy your content model. And you can do all these, all these things um, in a modular way, which is why um, then when dealing with these problems, I um, wrote this Contentful Utils uh, CLI tool. It's a small thing and it, it does some small things uh, for you when you try to experiment. With, with content models and try to be efficient about composing uh, fields um, for, for content types. Um, it uses the Contentful Management uh, JavaScript library uh, to, to do these kinds of things. And um, yeah, when you look at it, so can you read this? I hope. So basically it's the help, help output from this, from this thing. It has so far two commands. It copies fields and it deletes fields and um, helps you with something. So, for example, I'm going to show you an example now. <laughs> so, um, yeah, let's look at this. Um, how to copy fields from one content type to another. So, basically, what you what you provide this tool is you provide it as a global configuration, a space that you want to operate on, and you also provide it with a source content type that you want to copy something from, and you provide it with a target content type that you want to um, that you want to copy a field to or multiple fields. You can also do that. And then you have a Boolean flag that allows you to, to force the content type that you the target to be published after you copied the fields over. I'm gonna do something risky now and try to do a live demo. I have a fallback if this doesn't work. So um, can you see this? Right. Okay, so this is a space. And in space, we have Star Wars. So this is the Star Wars space. And the Star Wars space <laughs> has uh, three content types so far. It has a character, um, it has a spaceship, and it has weapons, so a weapon content type. And um, if, you, if you look at these things, um, where's my mouse? There it is, okay. Um, the character content type has a name, an occupation, and uh, weapons. So say it's Han Solo, um, a smuggler with a blaster. And um, this is harder to operate than I thought. Um, then you have, have the spaceship, which has a name, a length, uh, a maximum speed it can go, a pilot. This could probably also be a, a reference to another character, right? So hmm, maybe not the greatest content model here. <laughs> 
and uh, and it has a uh, a tractor beam, which is a Boolean property. Now, what you notice is the spaceship doesn't have weapons. Kind of dangerous. Um, you might want to give this, this spaceship some weapons. And we have this weapon content type and the character uh, already has weapons, right? So what we can try to do is we can try to, um, oh, this is the wrong terminal. Huh, where is my mouse? There it is. Um, We're going to use contentful utils to, uh, to copy over something. So here we, we, we call the copy fields command. We specify the space we want to operate on. Sorry about the shaky hand. Um, <laughs> you'll notice the, the format. Um, notice the format. So basically, this is the space ID colon and then the, the access token. I expect people aren't quick enough to type before I delete this access token. Um, and um, you have the source content type, which is the character. Uh, then you have you have the target, uh, which is the, the spaceship, and we want to copy the fields, uh, the field weapons. Um, I hope this works. So it's going to copy this. It says complete. Um, I'm not entirely happy with the console output, so I might uh, take uh, take a look at the. The library you used for the import export tools look quite nice. Um, okay, so let's check out our spaceship content type now. Uh, we see weapons, awesome. So, um, so now the spaceship has weapons and can shoot back at that star destroyer coming at you. Um, the thing is, right now weapons are not uh, a required field, right? So if you, for instance, go back to the character and you look at weapons, sorry about the janky mouse, makes me a bit slower than I would want to be. Um, you see, it's not required. So let's make it required because the empire just took over and we need to defend ourselves. So everyone should wear a weapon, All right? So let's require it, save the change. And um, then just try to, to do this again, you know, because we, we just, so we just changed the required property on, on the source content type. And we want to mirror this on the target that we had before or on any other content type that might use this exact type of field. Um, that's why it says like configure ones we use forever. Um, so we're gonna try this. And it prompts us if we want to overwrite the existing configuration. So what the tool right now does is it checks the type of the field that you want to copy to, sees is this compatible so you don't overwrite like an array field with something that is short text or whatever, right? So um, it checks that and if it's compatible, it will prompt you whether you want to overwrite. And we say yes. Go back to Safari and um, hit the mouse hopefully. Spaceship. So what we want to see now is that the weapons are required and, and they are. So that worked too. Um, so I found this, this really useful when doing things like uh, writing validation, uh, like regex validations for, for slugs or something like that, where we wanted them to have a certain format or for URLs or uh, just for reference fields. So if you want to have the same kind of reference field on one content type and one on another, you might just want to copy it over very efficiently. Um, this helped a lot with that. Um, back to the presentation. So this works. So I can use the, the shortcut. Okay. If I find my mouse again. Come on. Okay, I'm just gonna go fast. So these were the backup slides. <laughs> okay. Um, yep. Yeah. Okay. Now, one thing you might want to do, I mentioned that you might want to migrate to a fresh new space, right? Or you have, maybe you use these URL fields in all your places and you have one space for the marketing side, one space for something else that is like apps or, or something similar and they need similar types of fields. So you might want to do something across space and um, the tool right now supports this. 
So you can specify a number of spaces with this format space name, which is optional because it's just used as an identifier in the source and target. Um, the space ID and the auth token, then specify the source and targets with this prefix, which is the space name, and then just slash as like on GitHub or when you install some Vim plugins or whatever. Um, so um, you can do that. And um, now let's let's go back to, to the example. So turns out the other thing that happens pretty much entirely in space is Star Trek. And, um, in Star Trek, of course, they have not spaceships, they have starships. It's the Starship Enterprise. But in fact, the Starship isn't that different from a spaceship, right? It's just different terminology, maybe. Trekkies don't kill me. And um, so right now, this has been configured only with a name field. And um, there are other things a, a spaceship might have. So it might also have a length, probably it has a length, yeah. Um, it's an object. And um, then, it also has a tractor beam, right? Tractor beam is one of the very few words that are, or terminologies that are shared between Star Wars and Star Trek, I think. Um, so what we want to do is we want to copy over um, the tractor beam and the length um, from our spaceship from Star Wars to, to Star Trek. So let's clear the console and paste this. So, Again, copy fields. Um, we specify now the Star Wars space and the Star Trek space with these uh, prefixes. So we can refer to these pre prefixes down, or these names down here. Uh, we copy from Star Wars spaceship to Star Trek starship. And we copy has tractor beam and the length field. Please work. Let's see. OK, it says complete. So what we expect now is that the starship in Star Trek also has, has, has these fields, and it does. So this makes it really easy if you want to just experiment on a fresh new space to copy over some things, um, try it out, and, and build, build from what you already have and reuse. Um, okay, so one, one final thing that this tool does for you Work. Um, yes, don't know what's. Um. Yep. Yep. Is delete fields. Like as I mentioned before, it's sometimes a bit tedious if you have to do this over and over again, um, because you have to interact with these guys here in the in the content type um, when you're using the editor, and um, basically you disable the field. You save it, you delete, you save again. For this, you have the, uh, the delete fields command. We're gonna try this out real quick on, uh, on okay. Uh, we're gonna try this on the starship in our Star Trek space because, I don't know, the deflector shield is broken or something, I don't know. Um, and we're gonna try and delete this field, deleting fields, length, and has tractor beam. Oh yeah, right, we're deleting two fields, basically going back to where we were because maybe our experiment failed. Refresh, and they're gone. Um, yeah. So this is, what this tool does for you right now. Um, what's next? So I kind of hacked the interspace stuff together over the weekend. So um, it's still buggy. I'm, there are a lot of bugs to fix. Then the logging needs to be improved. And uh, maybe you want to do things like copy a content type just by itself from one space to another without like using one of the libraries um, and writing a special script or whatever. Um, and maybe you want to do something like field duplication. So say you have a certain text field that is a very simple thing and you just want to duplicate it with a different name on the same content type, you might want to do that. Um, you, you can find this thing on GitHub, the link was in, in the presentation. Um, and there, there's a long list of issues that I want to address at some point, but of course, pull requests are always welcome. Um, so if you, if you find this useful and you want to do something, 
open a pull request. I think Stefan already did because I failed to put the GitHub repository into the npm package.json file. So, uh, so um, yeah, it's not that discoverable. Also not published yet, so I still need to do this. Um, yeah, and then another note, so at sum up, we obviously write JavaScript. <laughs> and, um, and we're hiring for front-end engineers. Irina was so nice to take our uh, business cards and put them on the table. Grab some if you're interested and if you like doing this stuff with Contentful and uh, want to see the client side. Um, and um, yeah, sumup.com slash careers. I'll, I'll be here after the event. Feel free to talk to me. <laughs> also, um, I'm really curious how other Contentful users do content modeling. So if the stuff I've talked about in the beginning, like is somewhat familiar to you or you, you have opinions on that, <laughs> please come uh, say hi. I'm, I really like to have some exchange about like good practices and, and that kind of stuff. Um, so yeah, thank you. <laughs> Questions, yeah? Anyone, anything? <laughs> It was crystal clear. <laughs> okay. Thanks. Um, did I say it might fail? Before the <laughs> after after the complete message, I don't know. Like some sometimes maybe something is buggy. Maybe I did a like a, a copy and paste error in in my in my notes or whatever where I pasted uh, co copied the commands from. So. Usually the API does what it's what it's supposed to do, and if you get a version error, then you fucked up at some place. Sorry, was I allowed to say that? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, sure. Um, thing is, like a lot of these things are still in development, but um, basically, yeah. So I can I can I can tell you. Um, so one thing we do is for, for, so we still have content types for, for specific pages, right? So the landing page is a content type. Then we have these, these uh, merchant category pages that are content types. And for each of these pages, we need a way to model availability on different domains that we have, right? In 16 countries, you have a lot of domains. So you need to figure out the content that someone creates, the pages, the entries that someone creates, how are they available um, in, on these different domains? And the way we made this work is by creating like a website content type that is like driven by the locale and has a locale field. And, and this like configuration where you have a one to many relation, uh, relation from one page content type to like a collection of, of, of uh, website uh, entries, um, I copied this over a lot to, to when creating new pages. Um, same goes for like we, we use some so we we moved our stuff to jekyll so right now we're building building our page with jekyll and pulling in content from contentful using the jekyll plugin and um uh, there we, we we use a slug field on the um, on the individual pages to determine um where to put it uh in in like the output in the artifacts from the jekyll build and um, this slug field has like some, some validation regular expressions and stuff because we don't want people to put in like useless slugs. And, and this field, for instance, was also copied from one content type to another. And um, actually what I ended up doing as like a methodology was to, to create like a master content type that contains all kinds of fields that you might want to reuse on other content types. And then just always go back to that and copy stuff over to, to whatever new content type uh, we needed. Uh, yeah, so these are some examples. Yeah. So are these, uh, like all of these variables in the CLI, you can put them in a Yes. So there's, <laughs> there's a config flag, which I think is broken because I'm, I'm, I, I, I didn't get uh, yargs to work properly, but there is a config flag that you can, where you can specify a file name. So you could have something where you, where you have one file lying around somewhere with, all the spaces that you typically use, and then uh, you just specify this once, and then the tool reads out the config, and you have everything available at once. Um, this is something that doesn't quite work yet, um, but I, I want to get there. Yep. If you have one thing that you could ask your friends like to follow, one thing they should put more attention to, would that be? I'm yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Come to me after the thing, but um, yeah, I mean. 
these, this tool wouldn't be necessary if you could have pre-configured fields, for instance, right? If you had a field library and maybe make the fields even shareable, so you would have like a field marketplace where people could share <laughs> field configurations, something like that. So this is something this tool addresses, but where I think this would be a valid like business case to have this on your end. Um, but I think there are also other things that we've discussed internally and we can talk about any time. We'd be very happy to. <laughs> okay, anyone else? Okay, thanks. Do we need a break or? Um. Oh, I would say that just wait for a few minutes for a Okay. No, I will be right here. So I think it's going to be Can we also Thank you. Okay, so I think that we can start. Uh, so, hi, my name is Yaku, uh, and I'm here today to talk about GraphQL and how to use GraphQL with Content4. Uh, so, what I'm doing for a living is writing code for Content4, and it's almost two years now. Uh, formerly, I'm a part of our front-end group, but uh, during those two years, I had a chance to contribute to our back-end code bases, shared libraries that, are libraries that we share between front-end and back-end, our open source ecosystem, and our public uh, presence that is both marketing website and documentation. Uh, for what it's worth, I had a chance to implement content type duplication feature that had a smiley face in the previous presentation, so uh, that's good. So today what I want to do is to talk about GraphQL. Uh, my first goal for today's talk is to give a basic understanding of what GraphQL is. Then I want to eliminate some popular misconceptions about GraphQL, uh, what this technology does, what it doesn't. Uh, and the last thing that I want to show you, I want to teach you how you can query your own content from space with GraphQL. So let's start uh, with enumeration of what GraphQL is not. So first of all, it's not a storage engine. You cannot store your data in uh, GraphQL. You need some other kind of storage, like for example, Contentful, but you could also imagine using GraphQL with uh, Postgres, with MongoDB, uh, it's neither transport nor protocol, so it has nothing to do with how you move queries and data back and forth. It is also not a server of any protocol. Uh, you have to build the server on your own for the domain, uh, for the business domain that you've got. And it's also not a pre-built executable, so it's not something that you download from the internet and run. You have to use the libraries that are available uh, on GraphQL site and build their server on your own. So what GraphQL is? So the tagline at the page of GraphQL says that uh, GraphQL is a query language that can be used to, uh, to create an API. Uh, it was built by Facebook. Uh, internally, it was built around 2012, but it was open sourced and released to public in 2012. And uh, they claim that this is an alternative to REST. So what is REST? Uh, I think that uh, most of you know what REST is, but uh, just to briefly introduce you to the concept, we say that REST is a way of building web services, and it's basically a convention that is built around HTTP and data formats that we can transfer with, with HTTP. Uh, HTTP method stands for a action that you can perform on a resource and the URL is uh, a resource identifier. And all our content APIs that we've got in content for, these are uh, RESTful APIs. 
So what kind of query language GraphQL is? First of all, this is a query language that makes describing uh, data requirements in a very, very intuitive way. So as you will see in a moment, the query resembles how uh, the response looks like. Uh, what is also important, that it was already mentioned, this query language is data source agnostic, it is transport agnostic. So there are two main advantages of GraphQL. First of all, uh, the ease of iteration of your client code. Uh, so you don't have to worry about API versioning, you can just deprecate a field in your GraphQL uh, schema. This property is essential for building mobile backends these days, but uh, given service workers and all, and all this uh, fuzz that we've got in, in front-end develop development this day, uh, these days, I feel that, I think that this property applies to front-end development too. And the other advantage of GraphQL is that it's really easy to get exactly what is needed, not more, not less. Uh, the way how you get your data is very predictable and the complex queries are less complex than equivalent SQL queries that you might write for the same data. So let's do a quick demo first. The first demo is, uh, uh, it's not related to Contentful. I will be querying my sample API that is uh, some, somehow Facebook-alike. Uh, so let's take a look at the documentation of my GraphQL API. This tool that you can see uh, here, this is called Graphical, uh, note the uh, the single letter that you've got between graph and QL. Uh, the pronunciation is graphical. Uh, so you can use to query this, uh, query your own GraphQL server. So I created this GraphQL server and here's the schema of this GraphQL server. Schema is basically description of the data that you can request from this server. On my top level, on the top level of my schema, I've got something that is called fields and fields translate to uh, translate to endpoints in rest so as you can see i've got three top level fields and they resolve to uh, to type of user so if i call me if i call user with some id or if i request a page of users i will then get entity or an array of entities that are of type user and as you can see on type user I've got fields like ID, uh, quite obvious, but I also have a reference to multiple users and I have a reference to multiple likables that are objects that can be liked in my social network. So let's try to query my example API. So here's this uh, simple query that queries for the name of the currently logged in user, and that is me. So this is this me endpoint. But I can also request some additional data on this, uh, on this field, that is me, also. for example, ID, and then a list of my friends. But for friends, I have to specify what properties of my friends I want to get. So as you can see in this single query, what I've got here is uh, is a nested structure that rep represents exactly what I want to have in my application's view. Uh, so now let's try to fetch my likes. So on likes, I can always get a name and I can get my like count. Uh, but as, as you can see, uh, these two likes that I've got here, these belong to different categories. So first of them, this is a book, and the second of them, this is a place. So if we want to determine the type of entity that I'm requesting here, I have to use the special type name property. This is something that GraphQL provides, to, uh, provides for you. And now, given that I've got a name of, this play, uh, of uh, entities that are linked, I can extract some additional information on both places and books. So this way I can get really detailed, uh, really detailed uh, information about linked entities. So you could imagine that in Contentful, you've got reference to 
some other entries and you do not specify validation on content type. And then you can link this field to any entity that you want. So this way you can cast, uh, you can cast your entities to specific type. <laughs> And the last thing about uh, those top level things, uh, fields that we've got here is that you can uh, provide so-called field arguments. So I can, for example, query a user with user ID of four. And this user is named Bert. And again, the story uh, it's exactly the same. We can extract all the data that we've got about this user. So this is basically a very brief introduction to GraphQL. As you can see, querying nested data sets is quite easy and the response resembles the query that you write. So uh, quick recap. So there are three main building blocks of GraphQL. Uh, first of them is a type system. Type system describes possibilities of a GraphQL API. The type, this is something that maps to a single entity in your system. And the type, it enum enumerates fields that can be requested. And then the schema is a container uh, for all the types in your GraphQL MP, uh, API. And it also defines entry points, uh, entry points of your query. Uh, because graph, it doesn't have a start uh, and an end, so you have to define where you can start querying your graph. Uh, so a quick slide about JavaScript ecosystem, because this is the most popular one. There are two, uh, two popular communities. The first of them is, of course, Facebook, authors of uh, GraphQL, but there's also Apollo. And this is a community uh, built by people around Meteor uh, framework. And uh, these two communi communities, they provide you with both server and client side solutions for uh, interacting and building GraphQL APIs. There are, of course, uh, there are, of course libraries for other languages. Uh, the slides will be public, so you can just uh, follow the links then. Uh, and there are also a couple. Uh, We've got, I mean, at least the two uh, tools that are quite useful for developers who consume GraphQL APIs. First of them is, of course, GraphQ, and this is this IDE that I used in the browser. And second of them is GraphQL this, and this is a project that allows you to visualize schema of your GraphQL API. So now let's talk about uh, querying content, type, uh, querying uh, your own contentful space. Uh, so let's uh, let's do a quick demo of uh, yeah. So this is my space in Contentful. Uh, so as you can see, we've got three content types here. Uh, I think that you may recognize this uh, this space as uh, block uh, space template. Uh, yeah, so I think that the most important thing to mention in this space is that my post content type, it has references to both auto content types and category content types. Uh, so as you, uh, as I will show you in a minute, uh, what we want to do is we want to deeply resolve uh, those links in our GraphQL uh, queries. So let's go to demo and here I'm querying for categories, but uh, let's start doing some uh, really, really deep uh, queries. So I, what I'll be doing is, first of all, I try to uh, fetch all the authors from my space. And now let's go deeper with uh, our uh, resolvement of link properties. So for example, auto has uh, its own profile photo. So you can request URL and the title of this profile photo on the user and all the entities are automatically resolved. I think that uh, even more uh, interesting example is requesting posts and then requesting linked entities on the post. So for example, each post can have multiple authors. So let's get a title and a Slack 
first and then request the name of the author. So as you can see, we've got two levels when it comes to resolving the data, but we can then resolve it even deeper. So this is a nice, uh, nice example that shows that with a single query, you can request all the data that is needed to render a view in the application. Uh, so this is just direct nested queries in Contentful, but we also have this, this graph gives us opportunity to implement back reference, so-called back references in a simple and generic way. Uh, so if you don't know, back references is referring the uh, other side of one direction reference that you've got in Contentful. So for example, you can refer you can refer author of a blog post, but if you know, want to know uh, authors of this blog post, then you have to have another relation to just back reference to uh, the parent entry. If you don't want to do it, then of course with our, co our content APIs, you can do it manually. You can fetch all the data, filter them, uh, given the value that you've got in your parent field, uh, but it's nice to have the generic solution. So the generic, generic so solution for this problem uh, that we've implemented in this tool is called back references. So let's try to get all the posts by each and every auto that we've got in our space. So what we are doing here, we are selecting all the autos and for the auto, we are getting the name. And then inside of this automatically generated backrefs fields, you can get posts that will link via the auto field in the parent entry. So we are getting a title, we are getting a Slack, and then we can go even deeper by requesting a category name. So uh, as you can see, on the top level, we've got list of our autos. So we've got Lewis Carroll and we've got Mike Springer. But inside of back references, we've got lists of posts that are children of those authors. So this tool gives you uh, this nice mechanism as a generic tool, not something that you have to implement on your own. Yep. So what we've just seen, this tool is called CF GraphQL. And this is a project that was created in Contentful Labs. So uh, our GitHub Contentful organization uh, holds all the projects that are officially supported and uh, we won't withdraw our support for those uh, projects. Contentful Labs is an organization that uh, has our attention, attention of Contentful employees, but we do not uh, grant you support forever. But uh, you can think about this organization that this is a waiting list to make it to uh, content for GitHub organization. So if there'll be some traffic in this repository, then maybe it will happen someday. So what does this project do? Uh, first of all, it generates a schema for your content full space. It creates two top level fields, singular and connection for each content type that you've got in, uh, that you've got in your space. Uh, this is a simple proxy for CDA, so there's no magic. It will call our RESTful services. And if your query is complex, of course, it will translate to multiple CDA queries. Uh, what I've mentioned is that back, back references are supported out of the box, and uh, middleware for both Express and Connex is shipped with the library. So how do we host this thing? Uh, first of all, we've, uh, we've uh, created a deployment of uh, our demo and it can be, uh, it, is, uh, it is available public, publicly. Uh, the library is, uh, we ship it with a demo project that you can host locally uh, for both our demo space and your own space. And you can also run, uh, you can also automatically deploy this, uh, this, this project for your space or our, our own demo space to a service that is called Now. Now is uh, one uh, command deployment service by a component that's called Site. 
Uh, so what you can do is just type one comment and get running uh, instance of uh, of the solution that I've uh, that I've uh, demoed a minute a minute ago. So maybe let's try to uh, deploy uh, deploy this solution to sites now. But let's do it for some other uh, space. So it won't be our demo space. It will be uh, some arbitrary space. And what I'm going to use is our changelog space. So uh, right here, you can see our changelog application that we've got on our public's, uh, public page. Uh, and as you can see, uh, this application queries two entries. Uh, uh, it queries CDA two times. Uh, so this is an ideal place where we should be using GraphQL. So let's try to deploy. Uh, let's try to deploy uh, GraphQL solution for this space. So what, what I'm doing is I'm changing my space to change log, and then I'm just obtaining my uh, space ID first. Uh, space ID, <coughs> and then CDA token. And then I run npm run deploy now. So as you can see, it grabs CMA token from my environment variables. You still need to provide it. Uh, and now I'm deploying the whole project to uh, now. So as you can see what it does, it just installs all the dependencies and then it runs the server and when the server is running correctly, then we will get a working URL. So let's jump to this newly created API. And as you can see, those top level fields were automatically generated and we can request exactly the same data that we've got in our content for space. Well, that's it. <laughs> Questions? Yeah. Um, the question is if uh, it is a no JS application, and the answer is yes. <laughs> no, I'm repeating questions because there are people listening. And um, where do you use this server application? Or can I use libraries even without using server? Uh, yeah, so. Not just uh, like doing Jamstack, just to collect all my entries and use something like Jekyll or Guard and do some stuff. Uh, so the question is if we have to uh, serve it and if we have to host it somewhere. Uh, so uh, the answer here is that CF GraphQL, it is a library. So what it does, it takes your uh, content for space. Uh, in detail, it takes uh, a response from content types endpoint that we've got in CMA, and then it transforms it to GraphQL schema. If you want to run it in a process, for example, in process of uh, generation of static pages, then it's just fine. I mean, you won't be running server, but you will be still querying the, this data with, uh, with, uh, with GraphQL. Of course, our main uh, use case is hosting a server that allows you to query uh, your data interactively. But I could imagine that you could use it inside of a short running process. Yeah, maybe for the sports. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, um, GraphQL, the, the messages you presented are like the immediate queries or are specific queries where I can get the data ready for my view. Um, then I guess another advantage is that because you have these specific queries tailored for your application, you also have savings in terms of data, right? Because with Contentful, you also get a lot of metadata with, with whatever you query for. Um, and another advantage, yeah, and, and my question then is, um, 
given that I create the content model in Contentful myself, right? I don't get this benefit that I would get if I query the GitHub API and need to get like repo information, committer information, and all kinds of stuff. Usually I would expect to be querying for the exact model that I configured. So at least for me, maybe there are the, the back references as well. So can you maybe uh, name some, some, some more specific advantages of using the GraphQL wrapper, so to speak, compared to just querying the REST API? Because you already have all these filtering functions, right? Mm -hmm. And I can be very specific with what I want to get from the, from the REST API already. Yeah, uh, sure. So, so the question is, uh, what are the advantages uh, of uh, GraphQL of using GraphQL in conjunction with uh, with GraphQL content okay. with, with GraphQL? Uh, because uh, there was an observation 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 that uh, you, uh, I mean, you can filter your REST APIs, and uh, then the response is quite. Uh, uh, quite tailored to your needs, so you don't really need GraphQL. And of course, uh, I can agree. Uh, I mean, uh, of course, you can do anything that you can do with this library using CDA. Uh, that is our REST API. There's no magic. We are not using something that is uh, not public. This library uses exactly the same internals that you could use with our JavaScript SDKs. So it's, uh, we are not claiming that this is a better way to, uh, to query uh, contentful spaces. We just see that a lot of people uh, like to work with GraphQL. They, for example, build uh, React views and uh, approach that GraphQL presents. It works pretty well with, uh, with React views. So this is right now, this project is mainly a developer's convenience for people who like to work with GraphQL, and when it comes to when it comes to uh, spe and when it comes to specifying how this solution is better than our RESTful APIs, I don't feel like we are at this at this point in time. Uh, the other thing that I want to mention is that you can still use all the query string parameters that you use with CDA. In GraphQ in CF GraphQL, so uh, I didn't show uh, show this particular feature because it's quite advanced. But you can still all the collection fields that you've got in your GraphQL API. You can still filter them with all the filter options that you've got in uh, that you've got in uh, in our CDA endpoints. So I could imagine that it gives you both. Uh, uh, very narrow and uh, specific data set in response, but it also gives you uh, this convenience of having a single query that returns data that you need. Yeah. Danny? So I made a full flow list based on a property. So give me all the authors where the name is Dan. Yes. How deep can you go with that? Can you go give me all the authors where the cousin's mother's name is Dan? You can go one level deep with uh, the feature that you've implemented. That is. Uh, but the GraphQL doesn't do it No, no, no. GraphQL is about querying and accessing. I mean, it's not even about it's not even about querying. To be honest, it's about specif specifying uh, data requirements for your views. So it's not good uh, when it comes to filtering. Nobody said that GraphQL does a great. Uh, work with filtering. Uh, if you've, uh, I mean, uh, in this project, what we do is for filtering, we just get the same thing, the same query string that you would pass to uh, to CDA call. And I think that even GitHub does exactly the same thing. So there's no good solution right now, to be honest. I've, I haven't seen a GraphQL API that. Uh, that uh, does it. But it can't go deep just because contemporary data doesn't go deeper than that. So. Yes, sure. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay, thank you.
So you're welcome to uh, hang, hang out with us and ask all your questions in yep. person. I'll be back in like five minutes. So. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.